In part four of chapter 13, we are going to be discussing part two of IR, right, which is three parts. So part three, four, and five from chapter 13 are all about IR, and this is the middle installment where we're going to discuss why we see these absorption bands show up at some different frequencies and how come some are wider than others. So previously in the last video, we established that we have a carbonyl absorption band at around 1700 wave numbers. Okay. But the exact position can be shifted by a couple of factors. And one of those factors is electron delocalization. Okay. So look at these two comparisons, right? Two pentanone where we've got this ketone where that carbonyl is right, just purely localized versus two cyclohexanone here uh, where that carbonyl, the pi bond character, is delocalized by resonance. Okay, We have a minor resonance contributor over here, which gives the carbonyl some single bond character. Right, So here, double bond with some single bond character versus a pure double bond over here. Okay? So the more the double bond character, we can think about it as being a stronger bond, so it appears at a greater frequency, a higher wave number further to the left. So another way to put this is that if you have resonance in your pi bond, it's going to shift you to a lower wave number, so further to the right. So if I have a pure double bond, I'm going to look at it at 1700 or just slightly to the left. Here we see it at 1720, and you see that that's always a nice strong peak. Versus if I have one with some single bond character, it's going to shift it ever so slightly to the right, in this case by about 40 wave numbers. Okay, so less double bond character, meaning more single bond character. So it's delocalized, lower the frequency, shifts it to the right. So that's one reason these things could move around. Another reason is other substituents that are in proximity to the double bond. Okay? If I've got resonance electron donation, right? So previously I was thinking about my, my double bond shifting down and away. Okay, but here, if I've got a lone pair of electrons on a substituent that's immediately next to the carbonyl, right, it can donate electrons, right, kicking that pi bond up. So again, my double bond in my carbonyl has some single bond character. So that's another factor that's going to decrease the frequency and cause it to shift right. But that's also paired with the fact that if this is an electronegative substituent, which nine times out of 10, oh, it's going to be, Right? If it's electronegative, then it's going to withdraw electrons inductively. So now the question becomes, does the factor, you know, is it more donating by resonance, what we see on the left here, or is it withdrawing inductively, what we see on the right? Okay? So if I have something like an ester, okay, we see that the carbonyl has shifted to the left. It's appearing at a higher frequency. Okay? So that means that it has less single bond character and a higher wave number, meaning that the primary effect here is inductive electron withdrawal. It's not donating by resonance because oxygen doesn't want to tolerate a positive charge. So if you see a slightly higher carbonyl peak, notice here it's at 1740, so slightly further to the left, that's a clue that you might be dealing with an ester. Right? Remember, an ester is a carbonyl with an oxygen right next door. What about an amide? Okay. Well, look at that shift down, right? Now we're all the way down to 1660. So you see there's quite a range here where this carbonyl peak can show up, right? Now we're at 1660 to 1740. Okay. So the effect here is that the nitrogen on the amide is donating electrons by resonance, which cause, has caused this peak to shift right and appear at a lower wave number relative to our pure ketone at about 1720. So here, shift right, right, 1660, and they would be labeled for you on a test. Right? It tells you that, okay, I might be dealing with an amide, and we'll see other factors that can give us a clue to that later on. What about carbon-oxygen single bonds? Okay, Everything we've been talking about in this video so far has been a carbon-oxygen double bond and a carbonyl. Well, what about a CO single bond? So, well, a CO single bond appears in a range of about 1250 to 1050 wave numbers. If you have an alcohol or an ether, 
They're typically on the lower end, it's about 1050 further to the right, versus something in a carboxylic acid, which has resonance contributors, so it has some double bond character that's going to appear a little further to the left, right, closer to that 1250 higher wave number range. Okay. So pure single bonds, they're appearing at about 1050. Versus, as I just mentioned, carboxylic acid, that bond is going to show up at about 1250. And if you have an ester, right, I told you before what you can look out with the carbonyl, but you also see two peaks when you have an ester, one peak for this bond and one peak for this bond. You typically have one at about 1250, that's the one that's participating in residence in green, and another one at about 1050, okay, because this one does not have residence contributors, so it's more of a pure single bond. So those two peaks for an ester make them pretty easy to identify via IR. All right, so if we go back and look at that here, we see a peak at 1250, a peak at 1050, plus our carbonyl peak, okay, that again is slightly higher, boom, you're 99% confident that you're dealing with an ester. Now, the other factor you might be thinking about, right, with a carboxylic acid or an alcohol, what about hydrogen bonding? So, well, these are like a gold mine in IR. Okay? Hydrogen bonded OH groups and NH groups are broad and they stretch at lower frequencies. Okay? So look at these. Right? If we've got a carboxylic acid or an alcohol, okay? they're hydrogen bonding to one another in solution. Right? And that polarity, as we discussed in the previous video, means they have some really intense absorption bands easier to stretch those hydrogen bonded OH groups means they have an intense absorption band, okay? The specific position and shape of the band depend on what kind of hydrogen bonding we have, okay? But those different hydrogen bonds in solution, which vary in strength, absorb at slightly different frequencies. And so that's why we see really broad peaks for these things, right? Look at an alcohol. Compared to, I'm gonna jump back a couple slides here. Compared to a ketone, where we see that really narrow absorption band, look at an alcohol here, right? Really broad peak. So a broad peak centered around 3,400, they're very easy to see, they're super useful because you can immediately identify the presence of an alcohol, which again, with that peak around 1050, confirms the CO single bond, okay? The other really useful peak that we see in here, right? This one right around here, on 3000 is dealing with your carbons, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay. And your sp3 carbon hydrogen bend over here. Okay. How about a carboxylic acid? Well, a carboxylic acid is technically two overlapping peaks because hydrogen bonding is occurring in two places in your carboxylic acid dimers. Okay. So that's why we see a little peak kind of like a shoulder here off of that main peak, and then another larger peak over here. And they're both overlapping that CH part that I discussed before. So how do you know when you have a carboxylic acid? Okay, well, you've got a messier peak compared to a pure alcohol right here. That's a nice curve. So a messy peak is clue number one. It's not the only clue, right? It's confirmed by having that C double bond O, okay? Because a carbonyl has both an OH and a carbonyl, right? Peak for here peak for here, and again, confirmed with those CO single bands. Okay. What about carbon and hydrogen? Okay. We can get a lot of information just from that little part, okay. depending on what kind of carbon we're talking about. Right. Is it an sp3 hybridized carbon? Is it sp2? Is it sp? Right. Or is it contained on the carbonyl? Okay. They all show up at different wave numbers. Okay. So a wave number at 3300 tells you you've got an sp hybridized carbon. 3100 to 3000, give or take, sp2. Okay. Just to the right of 3000, okay. then we're dealing with sp3. Okay. And then your carbonyls show up around 28 to 2700. So it all depends on the hybridization of carbon. The greater the s character, right, as we have on the top here, means a stronger bond that's forming therefore appearing at a higher wave number. <clears throat> yep. And of course, the things that are bonded to carbon can change that as well. Yep. So here we see our sp3 carbon-hydrogen peaks. 
there appear, like I said, just to the right of 3000, sp3 carbon hydrophy. Not the most useful thing in the world, to be honest, because most molecules in organic have sp3 hybridized carbons. Right? But if that's all you have, for example, then you know that you're dealing with a hydrocarbon. So a good rule of thumb is check 3000. If it's only to the right, then you're dealing with all sp3 hybridized carbons. Right? If you have any peaks to the left over here, then you're dealing with sp2 or sp. Yeah. So that's what we see right here. Some peaks to the right for our sp3, but then also this nice sharp peak to the left that's telling me I've got some sp2 hybridized carbon. So I've got an alkene going on somewhere in here, okay? But no alkynes, no sp hybridized because those would appear closer to 3300. Now, one thing to pay attention to, right, when you detect sp2 hybridized carbons, it could be from an alkene, which we have here, could also be from a benzene ring. Okay, so this is why we use multiple methods of detecting these things. Okay, if you do have a benzene ring, you're going to see a lot of peaks altogether. Okay? If you're ever in questioning, you know, ever wondering, I think I have a benzene ring, I've got a lot of peaks here, how can I confirm it? Right, you also get another benzene ring peak over here at 1600 and about 1500. Those two peaks right there also confirm benzene. Right. But these are tricky situations. Right? If we're dealing with just hydrocarbons, this is where NMR from chapter 14 can help you to be certain. Okay? It's a little difficult if you just have an infrared spectrum, which is why come exam time, you'll have multiple ways of looking at these things to predict a product. Okay? One thing to finish off with, a right, couple other functional groups. What about an amine? Okay. Well, if you have an amine, it's got hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, which can also do hydrogen bonding. So we see amines have a peak right around where we would have had our alcohols, except for an amine, you typically see two peaks right next to each other, okay? one for each of the hydrogen. So two peaks next to each other, not the big curve, like we said, with an alcohol. They're still a little bit broad, right? but two peaks right next to each other, also not as intense of an absorption band as we have with an alcohol. Okay. Then I have my sp3 hybridized carbons over here, okay. and you can confirm it with another broad peak over here at 1600 for NH. That's how you can confirm. Those two peaks, okay, I think so. Now I know with another broad peak over here, which is the same place we just mentioned for benzene at 1600, but notice how broad it is. That's the difference. We have a unique wave number to identify aldehydes as well. Okay. This type of hydrogen right here is unique to an aldehyde. It's a hydrogen bonded to a carbon that's on a carbonyl. And that gives you two peaks at 2820 and 2720. And that one at 2720 is pretty unique to an aldehyde. Nothing else absorbs here. So it's a pretty instant way to identify an aldehyde. It's that kind of giant, broader shoulder peak. Well, it's not really giant compared to the alcohols that we saw, but it's giant relative to some other things like this mess down here. We finish off with the carbon hydrogen bends. Now, this isn't necessarily things to commit to memory because now we're over in the fingerprint region, but a lot of those carbon hydrogen bends can help you confirm things. It's harder because they're closer together and they can be shifted out of this region if you've got a really strong electron withdrawing or electron donating substituent on the carbon. Right? But if you don't, some of these things can help confirm. Right? depending on what type of alkene you have. You might see some peaks here in right around the eight to 900 range. Okay, tri substituted will get you clo closer to 800. Your cis hydrogens will be down around 700. Okay? And then a variety of peaks for your methyl and your methylene groups. Okay? So again, not as useful as the functional group region, not even close, but just another thing to have on your radar. This would be kind of a last resort to confirm it this way after you've tried IR and mass spec and NMR. The only trick here would be look around 1380 right, for a lone methyl group sticking off. That's how you can quickly identify that. Okay. So this tells you all the things to look out for on a spectrum. 
in the next video, we'll actually start looking at these spectra and practicing how to identify molecules. But make sure before you get into that, you've got all of these recorded in your notes. Here's what I'm looking out for on a spectrum. Here's how it's going to help me confirm what kind of structure I'm dealing with.